In 2005, you published a paper about um, a database you developed of Aboriginal uh, stories, and you describe in the paper how uh, the way that you were storing these stories in the database was at odds with uh, the Australian Aboriginal own understanding of how knowledge is constructed. Could you say something more about that? Yeah, there's a couple of things there. One of them is that um, Aboriginal knowledge is, is um, seen by them to be a performative thing rather than a representational thing. So it's something that you do rather than something that you have. So when we thought that we had stories on paper in books, um, it didn't actually mean that to Aboriginal people. They saw them as sort of artefacts of previous knowledge production episodes that would be possibly called into um, new configurations of um, artefacts and objects um, for the ongoing work of knowledge production, um, education and, um, and governance. That was the first thing. The second thing is that um, trying to use metadata as a way of classifying and categorising stories turned out to actually interfere with Aboriginal knowledge practices. So, for example, the author of a story might be actually also the name of a place and it might also be an animal or an activity from an ancestral past and the idea of sequestering these different um, characteristics of a story into different fields actually um, prevented the sorts of connections that Aboriginal people use most in their, in their, um, in their knowledge work. So that partly it was to do with just the, the, the sort of ontology of a database itself and partly it was to do with the nature of a digital artefact um, and whether it actually contains knowledge or whether it's just a, a trace of some previous episode of knowledge work. That's fascinating. You also mentioned that Western science and the way that we um, develop knowledge in the West depends on this kind of categorization of things and the, the very sort of idea of how we develop knowledge in the West might be might also be at odds with um, indigenous ways of, um, of creating knowledge. Do you, do you think it's possible? I mean, what did you do to try to create a database that could reflect some of that indigenous ontology? Is it possible? Um, <laughs> Um, it's possible, certainly, to get rid of all the fields and to concentrate on um, the strings of texts that may be used within or about um, an, a digital object um, and, in that way, refuse any of the Western categories like the distinction between a person and a place or between now and then, so get rid of all the dates and things like that. Um, so it is possible to make an ontologically flat database, um, but I have come to the conclusion that it's actually some sort of fantasy of totalizing Aboriginal knowledge as if it were an objective sort of phenomenon rather than something which is always owned, always situated, always um, in dialogue, always narrativized. So that the very things that Aboriginal people value about knowledge and about place and about identity and about history are all somehow subverted by that fantasy of a text that has some sort of authority and has some sort of um, objective view of a, of a world out there. Mm. So, um, since I wrote that paper and thinking about um, ontology and epistemology, I think I've become much more interested in metaphysics um, in terms of how Aboriginal people have some sort of um, commitment to the world as constantly unfolding under their um, discretion and through their good behaviour and their goodwill and good worlds come out of good behaviour. Um, and the Western um, metaphysics of matter 
in time and space, that there's already matter, there's already time, there's already space, and we come along and try to make sense of it, is a completely different um, set of metaphysical commitments. And I think, um, and this is what comes out of my work with governments and governance at the moment, um, um, that Aboriginal people are trying to achieve something quite different in their communities from what governments are. And a lot of that has to do with planning um, and looking forward into the future and treating the world as if it were full of objects um, and that these objects somehow um, have an independence from human imagination and therefore they can be categorized and therefore language cuts nature at its joints so that the reality is already out there, structured somehow, and we can just need to find names for those little structures, and then we will have some sort of truth about the world. So the world is in that sort of um, epistemology represented, whereas in an Aboriginal epistemology, it's actually created by ongoing good faith work in, in, um, in collective action. <laughs> that might not have answered your question. That, that, um, that was a bit of background there. No, I actually love, I love that. It's fabulous. I'm just trying to work out what, I, I don't know whether you would be able to answer the next, my next question, because I, for students who are learning about the digital humanity, I mean, listening to you, I'm almost thinking, oh, we should just scrap databases and digital everything. Um, do you think there is like an... Uh... Well, certainly I do quite a bit of work advising people on their projects. And, um, and the advice is, and, and we, we have done quite a bit of subsequent work to this. I should send you some links to a lot more work on knowledge and databases, um, apart from this. Um, and I think that some of the conclusions were that um, Aboriginal people using digital technologies for their own knowledge work tend only to concentrate on their own collection of their own resources. So trying to configure them into something which belongs to everybody or anybody actually goes against that. But certainly there's a lot of work that can be done helping Aboriginal people look at ways of configuring um, digital resources to make their own arguments, whether it be to governance or to um, ed for education or for disputes over land or whatever. So that there is possible ways of doing good digital technologies with Aboriginal people. But one of the problems is our tendency to think of knowledge is objective, our tendency to want to make our digital solutions future-proof so that we want to do things like backing things up and, and um, um, we want to make things interoperable so that they, this system can work with this system. I think all those um, imperatives that come out of Western understandings of technology um, are derived from that notion of an objective world out there and objective knowledge. And so it invites people to try to make those sorts of connections. And I think what Aboriginal people are doing um, is saying, no, no, I don't like your database, but can you help me with my computer here because I've got this video here. Um, even on a big database like that one, if Aboriginal people are looking for something, it's normally look, they're looking for something that they made themselves. They're not looking for frogs and find all the books about frogs from 20 different languages. They're saying, my grandfather told that story. I think it might be in there. I need to just get that story so I can tell you that this place over here actually really belongs to that person and not to that one over there. So that there are ways in which digital technologies are used by Aboriginal people, um, but often they um, subvert some of the assumptions that are at work in, um, in <coughs> Western. Um, techno science. 